Hello, let's talk about one of the most difficult extractions in dentistry, in my opinion, a lot harder than removing most impacted wisdom tooth teeth, and that is a complicated second molar extraction. You can see this second molar has been undermined with decay, and so the coronal part of this tooth is probably is going to come off, break off. And then we've got to remove the roots of the teeth. And we also want to graft the socket because we're, we want to leave the option of an implant open if we want to do that in six month, months once the graft heals. Now normally I don't implant second molar teeth. I have the, if the patient has an opposing second molar, normally what I'll do is have the patient wear a night guard that covers that opposing second molar. Because as you know, it takes teeth 24 to 48 hours to move. So as long as they wear that night guard every night, it's gonna keep that opposing second molar from super erupting and people do fine with first molar occlusion. So the reasons I normally don't place an implant in the second molar reason, region is the sinus is right here. Here's the floor of the sinus. You'd like to have at least six millimeters of bone. There's not a problem penetrating the sinus a millimeter or two when you place an implant. There's a study in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com alluding to penetration of the sinus with implants. But the key is you want at least six to eight millimeters of implant in bone. The second reason I normally don't implant second molars is the bone in the maxillary molar region is the softest bone in the mouth. The hardest bone is the lower anterior. The second hardest is the lower posterior. The third hardest is the maxillary anterior and the softest bone is the maxillary posterior. So combining the sinus and often a lack of vertical bone for implant placement in the second molar region and the fact that's the softest bone and people can do just fine with first molar occlusion. I've probably got maybe 15, 20% of my practice that does not have second molars for one reason or the other. So for those reasons, I normally don't imp implant maxillary sec or second molars in general, but the patient wanted to graft it and just have the option of an implant if he wanted it. So when I do graft the socket, any socket of a molar tooth, I let the graft heal for six months prior to placing the implant. You know, you've got three to four roots, and so you can't place the implant at the time of extraction, ideally, because if you do, you want to place that implant in the frication between the roots so when you place it, there's so much space around the implant, you never know for sure where that bone is going to regrow and what the final alveolar crest height will be in relation to the implant. So I always, anytime I extract a molar tooth, a multi-rooted tooth, I graft it and let it heal for six months and then come back and place the implant. If it's a single-rooted tooth, I prefer to place the implant most of the time at the time of tooth extraction if we still have good facial and lingual or palatal bone plates. If the plates are lost, then we'll probably graft the socket and come back in three to six months and place the implant with single rooted teeth. So let's talk about extraction of this tooth. First, we're going to administer topical anesthesia and anesthetize the area and you can link to painless and profound maxillary local anesthesia in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com. This is an intraligamental injection which is very important and then we're going to draw the patient's blood and make platelet-rich fibrin which as you know is rich in growth factor. 
and we're going to use that in our graft procedure along with artificial bone. So this is the PRF, the yellow part, and I'm not going to go into how we make that. You can refer to the link, but we use this a lot in our surgical cases. You place it on this perforated tray and then put the lid on top of it and it squeezes the serum from the PRF clots and it goes into the tray below the perforated uh, section of the tray. So this is the tooth. You can see we'd had an old restoration on the tooth that had broken down and it had leaked and the whole coronal part of the tooth had been undermined with decay. So there was no saving of the tooth. So I'm making an intercellular incision with this 15 barred Parker. Since I'm going to place a graft, I know I want the flaps to come up as, as close as possible once I've grafted it. Now, what happens if you tried to extract this tooth in one piece, a single tooth extraction? Well, those roots go in this direction, so if you try to do that, you're going to have to extract it to the facial, and you're going to lose the whole facial bony plate. So I'm going to extract this tooth in three parts. We've got a palatal root, a mesial buckle, and a distal buckle root. So I'm going to cut between the roots and take the roots out in three parts. Now I know this tooth is probably going to be brittle, so I'll probably have to take each root out in parts. But you don't take the tooth out in one part. This is a big tooth, pretty big guy. And I know if I extract it, it's got to be extracted to the facial and I'm going to lose all the facial bone. So it's got to be extracted or sectioned into three parts for each root. Palatal root, mesial buckle, distal buckle root. So reflect, reflecting a full thickness flap. So I'm first cutting mesial to distal right down the center of the tooth. So I'm separating the palatal from the mesial buckle and the distal buckle roots. You want to cut all the way into the furcation. Be sure you cut all the way through the coronal part of the tooth into the furcation with this burr. A lot of water. And this is about a number four to six long shank round burr. A lot of water and just cut all the way through. Now I'm going to separate the mesial buckle from the distal buckle roots. This is tooth number two. So it's the upper right second molar. So this is the mesial buccal root, this is the distal buccal root, let me orient you, and this is the palatal root over here. So these mesial buccal and distal buccal roots are often really brittle. So I'm trying, I want to cut all the way through the furcation here on the buccal and mesial distal. I don't want to cut through the buccal plate though, ideally, just through to the furcation. So all these roots are going to be brittle, but the buccal roots will be the most brittle and there's a very good chance you'll fracture off, even trying to be very careful, the coronal part of that, of the, that segment. So this is just a small elevator. I'm just moving the pieces and here comes the mesial buccal root and there's the distal buccal root. I'm trying to just unscrew them after I've luxated them a little bit. If you don't luxate them a little bit, they're not going to come out well. You can see I've still got, this is the palatal root and this is the section of the mesial buccal root remaining. The coronal parts come has been extracted. It's a small burn out. In this case, I'm not cutting bone, I'm actually cutting tooth, the mesial part of the tooth. Remember when you elevate a tooth or a segment of a tooth, you've got to have a space to elevate it in two. You'll see on some of my other vi videos from extracting a bicuspid or a lower anterior tooth, I may cut between the tooth down to the gingival line to create a space to luxate it into. If you're trying to luxate a tooth or a root of a tooth and there's a adjacent tooth that contacts the tooth you're trying to extract, you don't have any space to luxate. So in this case, I don't want to cut the bone between the first molar and the second molar. I'm actually cutting into the tooth and into the mesial bone of the second molar. 
not the bone between the second molar and the adjacent first molar. I want to preserve that bone. So I'm creating a space both to luxate the root into and for a purchase point for my elevator. If you've got a root that's broken off even with the alveolar process, you don't have any place to place an elevator to luxate that piece. So make that little cut into the tooth of the bone so you have a place to place your elevator. Just trying to rotate that mesial buccal root. These can be very tedious. Had a dentist one time say he never extracted teeth because it was the most unpredictable part of the practice. This could be done in 15 minutes or it might take 30 or 45 minutes or an hour, depending on how things go. So just working, trying to get a purchase point to elevate that mesial buccal root. There we go. So I'm elevating between the palatal and the buccal roots and also in between the buccal roots. Try, just try to get a little luxation. And then once you do, you're going to unscrew the root, especially the palatal root. That was the palatal root. And once you get to the palatal root, you should be able to unscrew it just like you're unscrewing a maxillary central incisor. You just unscrew, just luxate, just unscrew it. You won't go side to side. You'll just unscrew that palatal root. I've still got a buckle root tip remaining. I'm cutting between those. So we've probably got five millimeters of bone between the furcation and the maxillary sinus. So I've still got the root tip of the palate. I'm showing you this extraction because if you've got a second molar on a young person, you've got a good chance of getting the tooth out in one, in three pieces, three complete pieces. If it's a bit of an older person, this gentleman was, I think, 67, then many times those teeth become more brittle, and especially if they've had endodontics or the tooth has been necrotic for a while, non-vital, then the roots are more brittle and it's more of a challenge. There's nothing wrong, by the way, once you've got less than a third of a root left, if you're not going to place an implant to just sleeping that root, you know, especially in the mandible, if you're near the inferior alveolar nerve, just sleep the root. Leave a third of the root. Don't, don't be a hero. Don't go after it if you're not placing an implant, and it'll do just fine. Just take it out to there, cover it up. patient will never have a problem by sleeping a root. The only reason we're taking these out is because the patient wanted the option of an implant. So I'm just, what the, the thing to take from this, as that tooth broke off and there became just less and less of the root in the bone, you've got to constantly create spaces between the tooth and the bone or the tooth and the adjacent tooth to get the elevator into that space so you can luxate it. If it's flat with the alveolar crest, if that part of the root is flat with the alveolar crest, you don't have any place for a purchase point with your elevator. And so you can't have the purchase point to elevate it and you don't have any space to elevate it into. So those are the two things you're needing. A space to move it into when you're elevating it and a space to place the elevator tip so you can elevate it. And these roots just kept fracturing off because they were so brittle. This one you don't want a high volume practice because this is taking probably at least twice as long as you thought it was going to take. So now we've extracted the parts of the tooth, and this is maxius cortical bone demineralized. And I'm mixing my platelet-rich fibrin. I'm going to mix the platelet-rich fibrin with the cortical artificial bone. And I'm going to place a couple of these pieces of PRF in there and then cut it up with my scissors. And then the liquid is the serum from the bottom of the tray that I, I suctioned out into a 5cc syringe and I squirted that in there to wet the artificial bone. I'm placing that into the, so this is serum, artificial bone, and pieces of platelet-rich fibrin. Just filling that up. So I'm making a distal wedge back here so I can approximate 
you can see I've made a, a releasing incision right here so I can approximate the flap. Now it doesn't matter if you have primary closure of the flap, you just want to get it as close as you can. It really doesn't matter if you have primary closure if you place a slab of the platelet-rich fibrin on the occlusal part of the defect. So here's a slab of that platelet-rich fibrin. I'm just trimming the distal part so it covers the graft. The PRF is kind of like working with jello. You know, it moves in. So I like to cover it with a resorbable collagen membrane because it's flat and you can put pressure on it. It's hard to put much pressure on a PRF slab because it just, it wiggles like jello. So here's a resorbable collagen membrane. This is Contour Adapt. There are several that are good. What I'm looking for in a resorbable membrane is I don't want it to have memory or the start shirt effect. I don't want it to keep bouncing back. I want it to adapt to the graft. So I've placed it over the graft and now I'm coming back and making some small cuts where I want to trim it. And then I take it off and I complete the cuts so I've got the right size. The objective of this resorbable collagen membrane is to be large enough to cover the graft or any defect and also to tuck under the uh, soft tissue flap so it's secure. You don't want to make it just fit on top of the graft. You want to tuck it under the palatal and the facial flap. So here it is in place and this is 3-0 gut suture. Place one on the mesial, one on the distal, and then one in the middle on the facial. If I have releasing incisions, I'll place a 4-0 to close, 4-0 gut suture to close the, the mesial in the releasing incision. Now here's a trick with suturing, if, especially if you're using gut suture. When you've got the two ends of the suture and you hold the needle part, I mean, you're gonna wrap it one, two, three times and pull. One, the first of all, one, two, three times away from you and pull then one time towards you and pull, and then one time away from you and pull. The three wraps the first time will secure the suture. If you just wrap it twice, one, two, and pull that, it may be loose. But if you wrap it three times, and then one time towards you, and then one time away, the three times that you do with the first pull will keep it in place. And here's a distal suture. And whenever you suture, see how I'm taking a big bite. Don't go in right here into the edge near the incision or it'll pull through. You want to take a deep bite both on the facial and the palatal. One more for good measure here on the mesial. See how deep that bite is. Here's the incision and this is way down in the palate. That's why you have to give an intraligamental injection, be sure to numb that palatal tissue. So you do not have to have primary closure because to have primary closure, I would have to make a big releasing incision and reflect all the way down to the non-attached or the non-keratinized gingiva. So in, in my opinion, it's more important to have the blood flow from the keratinized gingiva being continued to be attached to the bone. So here it is, and that's the final uh, suture. You can see we've got it nice and tight, and here's the edge of the incision here, and here's the edge on the other side and that will heal nicely. So we'll let that graft heal for six months and then come back and reevaluate, see how much vertical bone we've attained from the graft and decide if we'd like to place a graft or not. So that's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time. Click on the blue link in the description below and subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com for an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos plus many complete comprehensive cases not seen in Dental Minute videos. Plus there's a library of pertinent articles that all of us should read.